Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Corrine Jackson, and I will be the service leader this morning. I will be joined by our minister, Rosemary Morrison. We do hope you feel welcome here. Now, uh, Reverend Morrison has some announcements to make. So my first announcement, am I, yep. Uh, my first announcement is that the, the, um, that the food bank will, our, our depot of the food bank will be starting up again the first week in February. So everybody can say yay! Yay! yay. yay. So we're getting ourselves out there and doing our social justice work. Um, if you are interested in doing, um, in helping out with that, please let me know. Um, we're always looking for volunteers, for the tech crew, for greeters, for all kinds of things. So just let us know. An exciting thing that's happened is we have hired a new director of religious exploration. We have hired Oksana Atwood. She starts next week. And she will be working with myself and Maria and Janet and getting things organized to have a spiffy, wonderful uh, religious exploration program starting in September. She'll also be helping with some communications. Um, you should all have pebbles, four pebbles, some paper, something to draw with, and they we're going to be using those during the... Um, uh, you, I'm speaking to the people here, and I'm going to speak to the people on Zoom, that we'll begin to use those through the meditation, and children's story meditation, and then at, towards the end of the service, um, we'll be going to use those same pebbles as our pebbles of joy and concern. So for the folks on Zoom, uh, this would be a good opportunity for you to go and get some paper, something to draw on, something to draw with, and four things that can represent pebbles. If you have some pebbles nearby, that's great. You could use four lima beans, four black beans, four whatever. Um, for little lids, anything that can rep you can have four of that's perhaps within easy reach. And I invite everyone to join along in this, in, in this time with the drawing and the pebbles and using our imagination. That's my, um, those are my announcements. And I think Andrew wants some to say something. I'll just be quick. Um, we can't get the heat turned on, folks, so grab your coats. Uh, it's uh, chilly in here now. It shouldn't get any colder than this, but we've done what we can with the heat, and it may turn on, it may not, but uh, just uh, cuddle up and get close and, uh, and <laughs> no. let's... <laughs> no, no! We, we can't, we can't cuddle, cuddle if you've come with your plus one, yeah. but other than that, uh, just get your coats on and uh, it's gonna be a little chilly this morning. Okay, all the, uh, all, yeah. that's all, okay. okay. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, religious, multi-generational community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritual questing individuals joined in common support and action. We, believe, we welcome diversity, pursue the common good, and work for justice. We believe in the compassion of the individual heart, the warmth of community, well, this is kind of warm, and the search for meaning in our lives. We begin with a time of contemplation and music with this prelude.
We gather with gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May we be good neighbours to one another, good stewards for our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. And so, as we begin this special hour together, I invite you to quiet your devices and yourselves so that we may all enjoy the service further. May we be reminded of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know uh, once again that we are not isolated beings, but are connected in miracle and mystery to the universe, to this community, and to each other. Now we will have the chalice lighting. Okay. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our questions deep, our heart's deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and welcoming of multiple truths. Now we will have a hymn, number 346, Come Sing a Song with Me. one of my favorites. It's a lovely little piece. So happy to be here with you this morning, either you're here in person being brave with the ice and the snow or online. Thank you for being here this morning. I'm so glad we're here together. My name is Reverend Rosemary Morrison and I'm going to start out now with um, a children's story, sort of. It's a sort of a children's story. So this is from the book by Thich Nhat Hanh, and it's called A Handful of Quiet, the Pebble Drawing. So you have paper, you have pens, crayons, and I invite you to have those. Maybe you could use your hymn book to draw on, or your lap, or something. But you will be drawing during this meditation. 
or this children's story. And then you're going to use the drawing again later, so don't get rid of it, and the pebbles later, so don't get rid of those. Thich Nhat Hanh says, some years ago, right, yeah, Gerard, you need a couple pieces of paper, some four pebbles, and some crayons or something to draw with. Some years ago, Thich Nhat Hanh says, I held a retreat for children in Santa Barbara. Many hundreds of children came for the retreat, and their parents were there, of course, to support them. During that retreat, we invented this pebble practice as a tangible way for children and families to return to their breathing and their bodies and connect to the world around them. Each of you should have four pebbles, a piece of paper, and something to draw with. Each of these pebbles will represent something in nature. One will be a flower, the second a mountain, the third calm water, and fourth, space. Each image, flower, mountain, water, space, embodies a particular quality. Now choose one pebble. Examine it. Hold it in your fingers. See how it feels. And on one section of the paper, and you'll need four sections. You can use both sides or get more paper, whatever you like. Draw your pebble the one you have chosen for your flower. I invite you to draw a pebble. And then in the same section, draw the flower. First you have to think of the flower. Sorry, I missed that step. Think of a flower in your mind's eye, or a flower that you like, or a flower that you know how to draw. I only know how to draw one flower, so it would have been, that's the flower I would have chosen. And in that same section with your pebble that represents the flower, draw your flower. And as you're doing this, Thich Nhat Hanh says, each of us is born as a flower. And the seed of flowerness is in all of us. Maybe thinking of yourself as a flower will help you smile easily and feel fresh and beautiful as a flower. I'll give you a moment. Don't get too elaborate, because we're going to move on. We're moving on to a mountain. You can draw, pick a second pebble when you're ready. And you don't have to finish, of course, by the time this children's story is finished. You can continue on drawing on your paper. So obviously you're going to be drawing your four pebbles, you're going to be drawing a flower, a mountain, still water, and space in time. So we'll get to all of those. So choose your second pebble. This pebble represents a mountain. I invite you to draw your second pebble on a second piece, part, portion, section of your paper. And as you do that, I'm going to tell you that there is a mountain e inside each of us, and it keeps us solid, and it keeps us calm. Solidity makes it possible for us to be happy. And when you are solid, people can rely on you. Your solidity is something that you can offer to the world. And as, the, as you're thinking of yourself as a mountain, Draw a mountain. The third pebble represents calm water. Look at your pebble that is going to represent your calm water. And then draw it. When you are calm, when you are still, you see things as they truly are. You reflect. You don't distort things. When you are, cal when you are not calm, it's easy to get confused and angry. All of us make a lot of mistakes and create a lot of suffering when we are not calm. 
each human being has enough tranquility to be truly happy. With the third pebble, we can cultivate stillness and calm. As you think about yourself as calm water, draw a still pond or lake alongside your third pebble. If you need more paper, please feel free to get more paper. The last pebble represents space and freedom. Draw your freedom pebble. Space is freedom, and freedom is the foundation of true happiness. Without freedom, our happiness is not complete. We want to be free from anger, fear, despair, and worries. All of us need some space inside and around us to be truly happy. Now on the last section of your paper, think about yourself, your loved ones, your need for space, for freedom, and then draw something that represents space. And Thich Nhat Hanh says, this is a hard one, so he gives some hints. Could be the sky, an open field, a kite, a flying bird. And then he says, try to smile as you draw Freedom, space. Space, as in outer space, as in we need space around us. We need six feet. We are fresh as a flower, solid as a mountain, calm as still water, and as free and as free as space. I don't want to rush you. I love it that you're all drawing. It makes me and my heart so happy. <laughs> we will be using these pebbles again during the meditation. And then at the end of the service, for our joys and concerns, you will be leaving them in the water. And next, we're going to sing Bring Many Names, hymn number 23. And I invite you to put your drawing down. But don't leave it too far away. And um, you can continue on. I will not be insulted if you, uh, there'll be a time in the meditation as well. You can probably draw. And during the sermon, I will not be offended if you draw. In fact, I will think that is wonderful. So hymn number 23, bring many names Stand as you are willing and able, and as your spirit moves you. Thank you. 
Sharing our abundance. Our community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all of the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. In addition to supporting this church community, we also make a, a monthly commitment beyond our walls. One half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. Some are local, some are national, some international. For the month of January, we are sharing our abundance with Change for Children. For 45 years, Change for Children has promoted health and human rights by championing, championing creative solutions to poverty through sustainable development. For those in the sanctuary, you can use the envelopes found in the inside cover of the hymn book if you wish to receive a tax receipt for your gift. Please indicate on the envelope your contact information so that we can send you a tax receipt at the year end. Many of our members and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawal from their accounts. Our offering plates are located near each of the exits. Those in the sanctuary can leave a donation at the end of the service. For those of you online, we encourage you to visit the um, Change for Children's website to make a donation. We thank you for your generosity and your support. With our time and talents and our money, we support the work of the community and this Unitarian Universalist tradition. Let us join in singing from You I Receive. Before we begin our meditation, let's just take a moment, a sigh of relief for the um, four hostages that were held at the synagogue in Coryville, Texas, and sorrow for the pain that the hostage taker must have been in to commit such an act, and our sorrow that he has died. Just take a moment, remember those involved, 
and what that must have been like for them. And then I invite you to open up your Teal hymn book to number 1008, Meditation on Breathing. You probably know this hymn, so like open it up, put it upside down on your lap if you like. 1009, I can't type. 1009, thank you, thank you, Rich. Thank, thank you, Gordon. Okay. And as we begin our meditation time, I ask that you bring your pebbles into your hand, one hand, or divide them into two hands, or hold them like this, however you like. And for those of you at home, please take your items that you have found and hold them in your hands. As we begin our meditation time with your pebbles in your hands, or your beans, or your unpopped popcorn, or whatever it is you have, I ask that you take three deep cleansing breaths with me. <coughs> One in and out. In and out. And one more. In and out. And now I invite you to allow your mind to notice where the tension is held in your body. Where does your body need a little extra breath, a little extra tension? Maybe you need to do a little wiggle to get some of that out. And I invite you to take some deep, intentional breaths into those areas of tension and pain. We can be our own healers. And then I invite you to notice what is supporting your body. Is it the chair? Are you on your bed, lying on the floor? And let yourself sink into those areas of contact. You are here, supported and held. Let yourself feel that support. Let yourself be held. And then let's just take a couple of, of silent breaths on your own time. Now I invite you to put your four pebbles into your left hand. And then pick the pebble that was the flower, or if you remember, or any pebble. And then say silently to yourself, I'll say it once and then we'll say it twice together. And you can do it silently or, or aloud, your choice. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. Breathing out, I feel fresh. Flower, fresh. And together. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. Breathing out, I feel fresh. Flower, fresh. And last time. Breathing in, I see myself as a flower. Breathing out, I feel fresh. Flower, fresh. Now put a second pebble into your right hand. This pebble represents a mountain. And I'll say it once and we'll say it together twice. Breathing in, I see myself as a mountain. Breathing out, I feel solid. Mountain, solid. And together. Breathing in, I see myself as a mountain. Breathing out, I feel solid. Mountain, solid. And once more. Breathing in, I see myself as a mountain. Breathing out, I feel solid. Mountain, solid. And pick a third pebble, pebble and place it in your right hand. This pebble represents calm water. I'll say it once, and then we'll say it together twice. Breathing in, I see myself as still water. 
Breathing out, I reflect things as they truly are. Water reflecting. Together. Breathing in, I see myself as still water. Breathing out, I reflect things as they truly are. Water reflecting. Breathing in, I see myself as still water. Breathing out, I reflect things as they truly are. Water reflecting. And now place the final pebble into your right hand. This pebble represents space. And you can say to yourself, and I will read it first, breathing in, I see myself as space. Breathing out, I feel free. Space, free. And together. Breathing in, I see myself as space. Breathing out, I feel free. Space, free. And last time. Breathing in, I see myself as space. Breathing out, I feel free. Space, free. Let's take a few moments of silence, just a few seconds, and then Gordon will begin meditation on breathing. Feel free to sing whatever part, all three, but not at once. Today's message is called Thomas Merton, a Unitarian Universalist at heart, and I'll have to admit that that's a bit of a stretch. The reading this morning is from Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander by Thomas Merton. Has anybody ever heard of Thomas Merton or read any of his books or anything? Yep, a few people. This is kind of one of his most famous quotes. In Louisville, at the corner of Fourth and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all these people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. It was like waking from a dream of separateness, of spurious self-isolation, in a special world. 
This sense of liberation from an illusionary, illusory difference was such a relief and such a joy to me that I almost laughed out loud. I had the immense joy of being a person, a member of the human race. It was as if the sorrows and stupidities of the human condition would overwhelm me. Now that I realize that we are uh, now, I now that I realize what we all are, and if only everybody could realize this, but it cannot be explained. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around, shining like the sun. Then it was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts, the depths of their hearts where neither sun where, ni where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach the core of their reality, the person that each one is in God's eyes. If only they could all see themselves as they truly are. If only we could see each other that way all the time. There would be no more war, no more hatred, no more cruelty, no more greed. But this cannot be seen, only believed and understood by a, by a peculiar gift. End of quote. If you are ever in my office, you will notice that there is a whole shelf dedicated to Thomas Merton. I have his famous prayer framed with his picture along with six or seven books, either by him or about him. I also have three more on my Kindle. I have been taken with him from my first visit to Vancouver School of Theology. When I first started at VST, they, they were still in what was affectionately called the castle, a huge building overlooking the ocean, and from the top classroom we could see far and wide and often bald eagles flew by at our eye level. A truly magical and wonderful place, and I was extremely sad when they sold it to UBC and we moved out. My first visit to the, the library at VST hand, landed me square in the Merton reading room. I'd never heard of him before that moment. There was this, this picture of a smiling, jovial monk next to a smiling Dalai Lama. I recognized him. I have since learned that the library at Vancouver School of Theology has the second largest collection of Merton works in the world. Louisville, Kentucky, of course, where he lived, houses the largest collection. But who was this enigmatic man, and why am I wanting to talk to you about him? I'd like to give you first a brief history of his life and contributions, and then I'd like to explore his trip to Asia, where his response to visiting the, um, I can't say the name, it's about that long, but the, the reclining Buddha st statues in what is now Sri Lanka. Then let's figure out why this is actually important, or at least I'm going to let you know why it is important to me and implications for us as Unitarian Universalists. Thomas Merton was born in Prades, France in January of 1915, and I always think of him in January. His parents were both art students in Paris, and they met in 1911. His father, Owen Merton, was from New Zealand, and his mother, Ruth Jenkins, from the eastern seaboard in the United States. And when the First World War broke out, they came to the U.S. and lived with her parents, who were very well off. Thomas had a little brother, Jean-Paul. He was born in 1918. I probably have my, all my, my dates wrong for the war. When was the First World War? Right. No, I do have my dates right. Okay. So sadly, Ruth Jenkins, his mother, became ill with ovarian cancer and died in 1921. After his mother's death, Thomas's life became very unsettled and ungrounded. And my belief, in fact, is that he never really got grounded again until that fourth and walnut experience that I just read to you. 
Merton lived with his father in Bermuda, who was living, living a free bohemian lifestyle, and Thomas didn't very often get to school. Besides living with his grandparents, his father he went going to prep school and boarding school. He contracted tuberculosis, and then his father died from a brain tumor in 1929. He was only 14 years old. Thomas spent time with his father while he died, and it was in this time that he first was pointed to the direction of spiritual things. His father, an artist, began drawing, Merton writes, his drawings were unlike anything he had ever done before. Pictures of little, irate, Byzantine-looking saints with beards and great halos. While Merton's father was dying, Thomas's grandfather set up trust monies for both he and his younger brother. It was with this money in his pocket, and as an orphan, he set off to school. He went to Cambridge and had a very difficult time there. He drank a lot, went to nightclubs, got into trouble, he got a woman pregnant, and the woman was paid off by his grandfather, an idea that was abhorrent to us in this day and age. He came back to the United States shamed, and his grandfather never forgave him nor spoke to him again. Then his grandmother, his only ally, died in 1936, and it was just him and his little brother. In 1939, he received a Master of Arts degree from Columbia for his study of nature and art in William Blake. And it was during his time at Columbia University they got hooked up with the um, Catholic Workers' Movement with Dorothy Day. He was working in Harlem at her soup kitchen and the Friendship House. And uh, his religious life kind of took off from there when he was with, with um, working at the Friendship House. And he converted to Catholicism. And war was then breaking out again in 1941, and the, uh, at the same time, the idea of being aesthetic, aesthetic, or a monk, I should say, became entrenched in his mind. And there is wondering, uh, because of the kind of um, fellow he was, that maybe he didn't want to go, go to war. So he signed up to be a monk instead. Speculation. But I think it's kind of funny. His monastic name was Brother Mary Louis, and he was simply called Brother Louis, and when he was fully ordained, Father Louis. His only relative, his brother, joined the Canadian Air Force and was killed while serving in Europe. In 1948, his autobiography came out, The Seven-Story Mountain, and it was an instant hit. And um, I don't know if any of you remember, have read that book. I've, I've read it, and um, it, it was a best-selling book at that time. It, wrote, it has sold millions of copies. I think people were really interested in this young, um, really interesting, young, lively man who decided to become a monk. And because of his book, Gethsemane, the, the monastery where he lived in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, just became inundated with young monks. They could not find enough room for them, and it was said um, that they had monks in closets or postulants in closets trying to and lining the hallways. So, and in uh, Firewatch, one of his books, Mer Mer Merton describes all the novices sleeping in the corridors as he makes his way around the abbey. So that was one of his jobs at the end of the day, going around and making sure all the fires were out and everyone was safe. Merton never knew if he wanted solitude. He begged for solitude. He begged for a hermitage. He begged for his own space. He was given a woodshed that he called... Oh, I forget what it was called. But anyways, he was given this little woodshed first, and then he was given a hermitage. And then as soon as he got these things, he decided he wanted to travel. And when I think of Merton, I think of someone who has had so much upheaval, tremendous loss, trauma, in the, and, and was shamed for, by his grandma, grandfather for kind of acting the way that, well, I know that... Uh, I certainly don't judge him because I can think of the way I behaved at that age. He was reeling from being on his own 
disowned without a home he, until he reached Gethsemane. And I think that's why, my personal opinion is that that's why he was so attracted to the, to the monastery life, is because he was so alone, and here he was able to find family. During his famous fourth and walnut experience, he looked around and suddenly realized he was not separate from anyone. Rather, everyone was inherently connected and therefore worthy of love, our first principle in action. Until then, he'd felt separate, distant, and was unable to find the compassion within himself to speak out. And after this moment, he became very vocal and wrote essays highly critical of militarization and the preparations for nuclear war. These essays were published in various journals, and he somehow got them uncensored over the abbey walls. And he had people in the communities around that would come by, and he would kind of toss his manuscripts over the walls, and then they would get published. He got into a lot of trouble over this, but it did not stop him from writing out against injustice and violence in all of its forms. In fact, in 1962, Merton received a letter from the Dom Gabriel Sorte in Rome, the Trappist's abbot general, for forbidding him to publish books or further essays on war and peace. And they still got published. By this time, he was corresponding with D.T. Suzuki, the Dalai Lama. Yet Thich Nhat Hanh was visiting him regularly, and many religious leaders. He was um, Martin Luther King, whose birthday is this weekend as well. Uh, he was his, one of his spiritual advisors, and also this brothers, Bran Brannigan? Brannigan brothers, that were very, very vocal and um, active uh, against the Vietnam War, and the Brannigan brothers came and visited him regularly uh, for spiritual sustenance. It was said of him that he was the wind that propelled many of the anti-Vietnam War movements. And here's my most favorite story about him. In 1966, he had to have back surgery due to persistent back pain. He was assigned a student nurse, identified in his biographies only as MS. They fell in love, and they were somehow able to correspond and see each other even after Merton's return to the monastery. This relationship lasted for almost a year. We only have Merton's side of the story. She was shielded and never told her story. He says in his writings that it was the first time in his life he truly felt loved and felt worthy of receiving love. Apparently the abbot was away for a lot of the time the affair went on, but after he returned he instructed the monk at the switchboard to begin listening in to the conversations between the two. He got into trouble again and realized he had to terminate the relationship. It didn't keep him from publishing. He put, published two books that year. And he loved to travel. And between 1967 and 1968, he traveled to New Mexico, Alaska, Santa Barbara, and San Francisco. He then went to Asia, where he went to India, Sri Lanka, and Thailand, having three meetings with Dalai Lama in November of that year. And he was moved greatly while traveling and visiting the temples and shrines. On December 10th, in a conference center near, near Bangkok, Merton died in between lectures he was giving at a meeting of Asian Benedictines and, sister, and Cistercians. He had been a monk for 27 years, and how he died was interesting. He left the morning lecture, and this lecture was the very first lecture that he ever allowed to, was ever allowed to be videotaped. It's the one and only. There's hundreds of cassette tapes, thousands of him um, teaching. He was one of the main teachers at Gethsemane. But this was the only actual videotape of him. And he finished his first half of his, of, of his um, lecture, and he said, let's all go get a Coke. And then he left. 
went to his room. He took a shower and grabbed the standing fan close to his palate to keep him cool while he napped. There was faulty wiring in the fan and he was electrocuted by it. Some say it was suicide, others an assassination of the CIA. People were really wanting him to be quiet. However, the monks at Gethsemane were not surprised by this accidental death. They reported that he, they were surprised that he hadn't killed himself earlier because he was such a klutz. As such, they would not allow him to use any machinery or drive the jeep. While in Sri Lanka, he driv, dr visited the, the I'm going to try to say it. I'm not good with words that are long. No, I'm not going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get to know me and know that I really have trouble with hard words. And sometimes with easy words. So these were these huge Buddhist sculptures in Sri Lanka. And as the reclining Buddha. So they were like huge, like bigger than this room. There are two times in his life that fascinate me. Well, his whole life has fascinated me. <laughs> One was when he went to Rome and spent time with the Byzantine paintings, and then near the end of his life in Sri Lanka at these statues. And we've been talking about intention this month. And I want to suggest that Merton lived a life of intentional, intentionality. However, this moment at... P-O-L-O-N-N-A-R-U-W-A. Polinaro Wa. And this moment was special. And I'll let you, him tell you about it. Looking at these figures, I was suddenly, almost forcibly, jerked clean out of the habitual, half-tied vision of things and an inner clearness, clarity, as if exploding from the rocks themselves. The queer evidence of the reclining figure, the smile, the sad smile of Ananda standing with arms folded, is much more imperative than da Vinci's Mona Lisa because completely simple and straightforward. The thing about all this is that there is no puzzle, no problem, and really no mystery. All problems are resolved and everything is clear simply because what matters is clear. The rock, all matter, all life, is charged with dharmakaya. Everything is emptiness, and everything is compassion. I don't know when in my life I have ever had a sense, such a sense of beauty and spiritual validity running together in one aesthetic illumination. I don't know what else remains, but I have now seen and have pierced through the surface and have gone beyond the shadow and the disguise. The whole thing is very much a Zen garden, a span of bareness and openness and evidence and the great figures, motionless, yet with the lines in full movement, waves of vesture and bodily form, a beautiful and holy vision. End of quote. What he was able to come away with was the intention of the statues, what they represent, the sincerity and devotion of those designed, those that designed and those that worked on them. Many believe that if he had lived much longer, he may have converted to Buddhism, but I don't think so. I think he was so in tune with the spirit of things that he was and that he was open to having that, what our first source names as the direct experience of the divine. That he didn't need to change, he did not need to change religions. Wearing the habit of a monk, doing the rituals, studying holy texts, he studied the Tao Te Ching, um, he, he studied so many holy texts. There were, they, these were all just the way and means to understand human nature 
and our, our human desire to figure out what's really going on. He, like many of us Unitarian Universalists, were open to learning about different religions. He, like us, wanted to explore the depths of his own mind and heart. And he, like us, was very dedicated to ending injustices in the world. He understood the value of all religions, and he was onto something really big. All religions are just trying to answer the big questions. And when you drill down to the core values of any religion, they're all just mostly the same. That's why it's so important for us as Unitarian Universalists to not think one thing is better than the other. It's important for us to remember, to understand there is beauty and value in every religion and every culture. It's important for us to not be reluctant to explore Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and Eastern and ancient religions. All have validity, and it's very important for us to stop having a prejudice towards any particular one. Let's be like Merton, be grounded in our Unitarian Universalist faith while exploring with open hearts and minds other religions and other cultures. So may it be. Amen. And so let's just take a moment, a couple of breaths, and as we prepare ourselves for our pebbles of joy and concern, I ask that you take your pebbles and hold them in your hand. And when you are ready, you may come and put one or two or all into the water. For you folks on Zoom, this is your opportunity to put your joys and concerns into the chat. You are invited to come forward now.
So are we okay to sing a hymn? Or do you want to go home? <laughs> I'm running late today, folks. You okay with it? We're going to sing a ho- hymn? Yes? <laughs> if you're, you're welcome to, to... It's Time has expired, and you're certainly welcome if you have commitments to um, head on home. Hymn number 1028, Fire of Commitment. I've been told that you sing, have sung this before, and I just say, that's good on you. <laughs> so let's give it a whirl. <laughs> 1028 in 5 4 time. Yay. <laughs> Distinguishing the flame. We keep it light, we keep its light in our hearts by Maddie Stevanich. We extinguish this flame, but we keep its light in our hearts with its message of love and justice, taking it outside these walls to the world we live in until we are together again. Am I okay here for the camera? Yeah. I'd like to thank everyone that contributed to this service. Oh, thanks, Corrine. Um, really appreciate you coming in person and being here online with us, being on the tech team, greeters, piano players, singers, drawers, worship associate, service leader. Thank you so much for your contributions and your attentiveness and your drawing. Our closing words are by Thomas Merton. What else? Our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That's not our business. And in fact, it's nobody's business. What we are asked to do is love. 
And this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy. So go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. And I invite you to do what you do and look at each other in the eye and sing, carry the flame. And if you're new to us, carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. And we pretend we're holding hands, but we don't. Thank <laughs> you.